Hello, hello, hello. We are back in our Taylor Swift March. Today we are going to be going through some of our Tortured Poets Department era unpopular opinions. So some of these have to do with like the tour, um, some of them have to do with like the album itself. Um, they all only have to do with like the standard edition of the album because that is the only one that I've ranked and analyzed on this channel. That's the only one that I've like gone through and like deeply registered my opinion on. So that is what we're going to be talking about. I have 10 unpopular opinions and then one bonus popular opinion I feel like that's just really important to me. So we're gonna end with that one and without further ado let's just get into our unpopular opinions. I haven't done a video like this before. Um, I've just gotten comments fighting against me on my just, just regular commentary and opinions so we'll we'll see how this one goes. Um, I feel like I have seen other people with this baseline opinion but I haven't seen them necessarily describe the same reason why. So I understand why So Long London is the track five. Before you click off, before you skip forward, give me a moment. Don't assume. Thank you. I feel like when this record was imminent, um, from the moment it was announced, from the moment we saw the track list, we were all sitting there waiting to hear about what happened with Jeff. That is what we were so hungry for. We saw So Long London and we said, tell me more. And this song did that. It might not have been the most upbeat, exciting version of that, but I feel like it pretty much flushed out all of the answers that we were looking for. And there's a rawness and a really specific type of sad ending to this track and this relationship. And I feel like now that Taylor is aware of the whole track five thing, I think that it makes sense to her to put the one song, really truly the one song that is centered entirely around answering the London boy question, um, as it were, as track five. Because in that way, it really does kind of stand alone. You know, as the Swiftologist says, there is turkey cooking on this album, but it's really not as direct as I think we expected it to be. Because Guilty as Sin and Fresh Out the Slammer are about <laughs> coming back home to Maddie, are about thinking about Maddie writing mine on her upper thigh only in her mind. But the reason she's feeling guilty, the slammer she is out of, is Sir Joseph and their house on the heath and the way those are described are not flattering and they all continue to circle back to this really painful aching gray song in one way or another. They all kind of just come full circle with this song at their core of the Joe story. It all makes sense. It is very filled out um, with this song. This song was really kind of the last page. And so, like I said, in that way, it stands on its own. And I think that it makes sense that it was placed as the track five, because while I think LML is a great candidate, and I absolutely heard it and was like, ow, um, that hurt in a special, special, special Taylor Swift way. And, you know, it harkens back to other track fives, like all too well. Um, but I think there's a real timeline to this album, especially I Can Fix Him, No Really I Can, to LOML, to I Can Do It With A Broken Heart, to The Smallest Man Who Ever Lived. I feel like that is a real timeline. Um, and I think that that is like incredible track placement. Taylor is not always amazing at it. I'm always intrigued by what she does. Um, and kind of just by listening to the albums in order, I've just kind of fallen in line with listening to them that way over the years. Um, but this is just so incredibly narratively strong, in my opinion, from, whoa, maybe I can't to LOML, to I'm so depressed I act like it's my birthday every day, to were you sent by someone who wanted me dead and I'll forgive you but I'll never forget, you fucking rat. Like I, that's such 
what a story. What a freaking story. And it's all supported and backed up by other songs on the album that kind of like slot in. But that's just such a tight timeline that I just absolutely would not want to mess with by taking LML out and placing it at track five. So Long London is really specifically about the Joe relationship. And like I said, being the last page of that book. And so if it's not going to be, I don't think it's a good track one. I don't think that that, I mean, if you're really going to make this a chronological album, fine, put it as track one. If that's really, really, really your goal, okay. But I don't find it to be inviting as a track one. I find it to be intriguing if you are listening to the lyrics and you're into the lore. But if you're a casual fan and you turn on this album as track one, I'm not necessarily sure that's going to encourage you to keep listening because it's a little weird and the production being just, it's not necessarily my favorite. I think the bleep bloops kind of are a little bit weird, but I'll, I'll take it. Um, I just don't know if you're not someone who is deep into the Taylor, if that's going to pull you into the album. And I think Post Malone and Fortnite will, which is again why I have a whole rant about why I think that's the first track and why it makes perfect sense that it is in my um, album analysis of the standard edition of this album. Go watch it if you'd like to hear about that. But anyhow, I understand why So Long London was placed at track five. It really feels like that is kind of where it slots in. If you're not going to do this chronologically, it makes sense to if you're gonna have the track five kind of be like its own thing that can maybe be lifted above everything else and be a standalone to take that opportunity to put so long london there makes sense to me what do you think <laughs> i i don't know if i should put this opinion second i feel like it's gonna make people click off if i put this opinion second I need you to promise that you'll stay for at least the third one. Do you promise? Do you promise? Can we? Okay, thank you. I appreciate you. I kind of wish that So High School wasn't on the tour. You promised. You promised. And even if you didn't hear me out. I love the dancers. I love the dancers. I think it's so clever and like all of the things she does, it's all so referential in the faces. It's so, so fun. But in terms of the songs that I wish I would heard her sing live, I just would really, if there needs to be, I'm so glad my Travi made it to the big game. I would rather hear the alchemy. And if I'm really just ignoring Taylor's feelings entirely. I'd really, really, really like to hear guilty as sin. Um, but I understand that she would like a Travi moment for Travi to do this too. I think maybe I just need to listen to So High School more. I've been very stuck on the first part of this album for the past two weeks. I was listening to both sides for a while after it came out. And then I've just been really, really stuck on the first half recently. And so I think once I start analyzing the second half, I'll jump over there and maybe I'll hop on, I'll hop on to you your guys' train. Maybe I'll eat my words. I don't dislike the song. Don't get me wrong. It's not like unlistenable to me or anything. There are plenty of songs on the second half of the album that I like less. Even even songs on the first half of the album that I probably like less of all the ones that I like am aching to hear live that could be in that slot in that precious, precious time. I'm begging for the Travi song to be the alchemy. And I'm really in my heart of hearts begging for guilty as sin. And I understand that's not gonna happen. And I understand that people are having a great time with it. I understand that Taylor's having a great time with it and Travis is having a great time with it. And that the Chiefs nation as a whole, that the NFL is having a great time with this song. And so who am I to hate on that? This is just my one little unpopular opinion and I'm perfectly happy to stand here quietly with it and accept that it's not important to anyone but me. Going off of that, um, I kind of already said, but the next one is that my preferred Travi song is The Alchemy. Um, I, whoever you want to talk to me about The Alchemy being about, I am here to hear you out. I understand 
both of your arguments um, and I, I see both of them. Um, I'm not here to fight about who that song is about, but it absolutely bangs and I love it. And when I first heard it, it absolutely just washed over me and I was in a pop girl trance for the entirety of it. Heroin without an E. It was fantastic and I, it is the same effect every time I listen to it. Now I love the alchemy um, in just the dumbest, simplest way. Because I understand it's not the most advanced um, song. It's the most like kind of like bubblegum pop girl bouncy song um, on the standard edition of the album. It's arguably the least lyrically advanced, but I don't care. I'm having fun. And that's how I feel about still having over 21 Direction songs liked on my Spotify playlist. I'm having fun. So let me have fun. And personally, I just connect to when I touch down, call the amateurs and cut them from the team, ditch the clowns, get the crown, baby, I'm the one to beat. I connect to that more than touch me while your bros play Grand Theft Auto. Personally, personally, and it's just, it's because it's a personal issue and it's because the concept of Grand Theft Auto really is a huge turnoff to me. Playing Grand Theft Auto is kind of a turnoff to me. And so the idea of like hooking up with someone while their bros are playing that game in the other room, it's just kind of a huge turnoff to me. It's a huge, and so I can't do it. Um, and so that song will just always give me just a wee bit wee bit of it um and that's my problem following that up with another um kind of like sibling song um moment i have i like doing tiktoks that are like taylor swift like sibling songs and like songs that are family members and like how i feel they are related like there are some like grandchildren of other taylor swift songs on this album absolutely um Go look at my TikTok if you want to see that brand of delusion from me. I don't really go that crazy here necessarily, but I feel like Fresh Out the Slammer and Guilty as Sin are inextricably linked because she was Guilty as Sin until she was Fresh Out the Slammer um, because she was guilty. She served her time and now she's fresh out the slammer. And I personally, if you saw my song ranking video, you will know that I never really found a way to deeply connect with fresh out the slammer. And I really need to, I think, I think I might go to the beach later today if I have time, if I have time, I'm not sure that'll happen, but I'm really gunning to go to the beach and like start my summer beaching career. Um, me and my dog had a really nice day at the beach a couple weekends ago. And like, we're starting to like get back into that group of like constant beaching and so I feel like we usually go and we watch the sunset and so I need to have my little sunroof down and just be like chilling in a vibey mood and that's when I need to listen to fresh out the slammer because it's just never really it's just kind of this very vibey sway thing um and it's not and I listen to a lot of songs like that. I'm a big Lana Del Rey fan. She has a lot of songs like that. Florence and the Machine have a few songs like that that I like to listen to. But the thing about those songs is that there's something in their production or something in the lyrics that just like draws me in and is just like honey to me. Like I just love to hear it. Um, and I love to like hear the words and hear the production um, and just like journey through the song in that way. Fresh Out the Slammer doesn't have any of those things for me that draw me into it, but I know there's a reason people really, really like it. And so I need to find a context in which I feel like I will be in the mood for it. Um, Guilty as Sin took a moment for me to grow, but once it started growing on me, it really, really grew. And now I just love hearing the starting beat of it and just following that all the way through the song and knowing that that's the beat from Downtown Lights by the Blue Nile and like, just being obsessed with every single lyric and like again if I can follow a story or a train of thought through a song I will go back to it because I enjoy experiencing that story and Taylor Swift does a really good job of that um a lot of a lot of the artists that I listen to do a really good job of that and so on top of that I really like the sound of the chorus of the song. I like the sounds of the production of the song. And so I personally am a guilty of sin over Fresh Out the Slammer 
all day long girly i feel like that's an unpopular opinion but like i know guilty of sin is really 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 widely liked but i just feel like i see so much fresh out the slammer support jack antonoff himself i mean i guess he's he produced it but that was a song he chose to like shout out on like release day so i don't know i don't know um let me know let me know if you agree number five is that both clara bow and who's a forget of little old me belong on the standard edition of this album and i know that people are it's weird so people used to be super critical of taylor and say that like oh she only writes songs about her boyfriends that's all she does even though like that's like what a lot of other artists write about and they nobody says that about them but she also writes about other things um and now people are kind of picking on well they're picking on other songs too but now they're like why isn't this relation why isn't this album just a timeline of this relationship why aren't those the songs that are on the standard definitive of, of this album why didn't she set it up that way well i feel like if she had done it that way people would have been like wow this is an album about a girl having a mental breakdown about a relationship and she's in her 30s what else is new and just this misogynistic bullshit and it would have turned into that i can see it i can see it now um and i feel like who's afraid of little old me and clara bow expand upon the ideas and the frustrations presented in but daddy i love him but daddy i love him is a very wordy dense song with a very clear palette of ideas that have different flavors to them there's different layers of frustration with the public eye and relationship with fandom and her choices and her romantic relationships and judgment of her as a woman and purity culture and etc. There are so many layers of that but then in who's afraid of little old me we take a thread of that and we expand upon it we expand upon the anger the feeling of feeling like a caged animal we expand upon another kind of path of that topic when but daddy i love him is very much about saying but daddy i love him you don't gotta pray for me um me and my wild boy it was very much about her and that her relationships and that being talked about and that being criticized who's afraid of little old me is a little bit less situational about her and her wild boy the wild boy is not really involved in this song it's who's afraid of little old me who's afraid of little old me is about taylor and her relationship with her fans and the media and the public the boy is irrelevant uh, as much as the boy can ever be irrelevant in the taylor swift universe and then in clara bow it's a much different mood on the topic of relationship to the public and fame this is a more behind the scenes look at the rise and fall of stardom and it's not necessarily angry um and i've said again and again that i feel like this song is a commentary on the things that it's describing happening the words that are chosen and the way things are said is how Taylor feels and what she's saying about this process and what's being portrayed in this song. There's so much left unsaid and there's so much just like heavy context to the way things are presented in this song that if I feel like, I hate being the person to say this, but like if you get it, you get it. And if you don't, you don't. And I think to me, it really landed because I've spent a long time trying to be in the entertainment industry. And so there are certain words she uses that I'm like, that is what they say. Um, they love to use the word remarkable to make people feel special. It's just, just exactly what you want to hear. Um, and so she's so clever about that and framing these different starlets and what they went through and then the ones that came before them. Taylor's talked about this before in The Lucky One. Um, she loves to kind of ruminate on fame a little bit, but it's not something that we love to hear a ton. We don't love to hear famous people talk about being famous a lot unless they are particularly clever or um, agreeable in some way about it and she's clever here but i i'm not quite sure she's agreeable in but daddy i love him 
who's afraid of little old me or Clara Bow, and yet she seems to pull it off. And to me, I think it's because she's right. Um, I feel like I can't find the lie in either of these songs, in Clara Bow or Who's Afraid of Little Old Me. I didn't include But Daddy I Love Him because I feel like no one's arguing about that song being like a necessary addition to this record. I do feel like people are arguing about Clara Bow and Who's Afraid of Little Old Me. And I feel like they're they hold hands with that song and they hold hands with each other in a thread that is present upon this album because Taylor wanted it to be and then there are echoes of that in the anthology that we see that are kind of more distant thoughts but I feel like these are sort of the main three I guess. It's the relationship misogyny element, it's the being a pop star, being a famous woman, trauma and anger element, and then the flesh and blood amongst war machines, you're the new god we're worshipping of becoming a starlet in Hollywood and being told that you're going to be the next someone that is already there. Clara Bow is definitely a child of nothing new in that way. These are kind of, I think, the three big ideas that circulate around that in her mind that she turned into these songs. I feel like they connect to each other in that way and so it makes perfect sense that all of them are on the standard edition of this record intermingled with the relationship timeline that we see with Maddie as well as the final page of the book of the relationship with Joe. These all kind of, this just, they all make sense um, to be on this record and for the most part they seem to make sense where they were placed. If you would like to see me attempt to reorder this album, let me know. I have clearly thoughts percolating about it and I haven't sat down and done it. So if you'd like to see that, let me know. But yeah, all that to say, I do feel like these songs belong on the standard edition of this album and I appreciate them um, for where they are. This is another opinion that you basically heard me say when I ranked this album, but I enjoy Florida. Um, and I feel like maybe the fact that I enjoy both Florida and Who's Afraid of Little Old Me, two songs that I feel like people have tended to be pretty wishy-washy on whether they enjoy or not, um, explains why I have tended to be on the side of being an enjoyer of this album rather than one who kind of decided it wasn't necessarily my favorite product from Taylor Swift. Um, I, listen, <laughs> I love a melodramatic, moody, um, echoey, haunty, um, just screamy for kind of no reason, singing about vices in a very seductive way. Um, I am a huge Lana Del Rey fan and I have been known to enjoy a Florence and the Machine song here and there and so yeah, I was I was gonna like this song. This song is very much my vibe um, and it makes sense. It makes sense that I would enjoy it. If it was sung by pretty much anyone else, I would probably enjoy it too. Um, that's just me. I have to wonder if something different could be done with the banging sound after Florida, but I'm not sure if maybe that was intentional. Um, I've started to wonder if like after a while that's supposed to be the idea of like the pounding of the pain in the back of your head and the pounding of the hangover after you've just been like vicing out your emotions in the Florida heat um, for a while and I've started to be like, hmm, is that a part of the experience of the song? Um, I'm not sure, but I I tend to really like this song. Um, if you want to hear every single little thing I have to say about it, definitely check out my analysis. But I feel like it really gives the idea of Miami or somewhere bougie like Destin, you know, in Florida, where it's just hot and sweaty and you really can if you have the money to just be in the pool with a drink in your hand all of the time um, and not think about it too much. Um, Florida gives you permission to do that if you would like to. There's a lot of opportunity to do that. The drinks are flowing there all of the time. Retirees and vacationers, if you want it, you can find it. And and that's not even getting into the whole like Florida kilos like Lana um, of it all, although I'm not really sure that's what Taylor was talking about here. I'm not sure it really gets that dark um, within the song. I feel like this is more like 
personal internal um crime than literal external crime but yeah i i enjoy a vaguely mysterious song um and the fact that this is florence and taylor love them both love florence's verse on this song i absolutely just slurp it up um like a beautiful floridian margarita towards the end of the song when taylor says love left me like this i don't want to exist just absolutely makes this song all the more worth it um and it really is a great it's a great driving down the california freeway um with the sunroof down a song um even better if you're in florida i'm sure if you're in florida it's even more effective i'm not sure what the highway that goes like along the coast of florida maybe in miami is um but i'm sure if you're there you're having a great time i know there are other enjoyers of this song i just need to find them Okay, we're gonna take a break um, from talking about songs on the record and we're gonna skip to a tour opinion. I personally don't need wild streams and I don't need champagne problems. I understand that we need a moment in the Folkmore set to sit down at the piano and have our little chit chat. Um, champagne Problems is just a long ass song and all I can think of is the precious minutes for other tracks but it's fine. I know that's a solo opinion that I have. And while the streams is fine, I guess, I guess the, the visuals for it are just not, they're not anything special to me. And it's just sort of there. I feel like it brings the tempo down from the really bouncy, otherwise 1989 set in a way that I'm not sure is entirely necessary. Um, and it just, it just kind of takes up time. I don't know. I don't feel like it's essential. Um, and I could see it just be knocked out um, for, for something like another another speak now song or maybe a different song from lover i wouldn't i wouldn't say no to another fearless song um i've lost the hope for a debut she's not going to acknowledge it she's not going to say anything to it um but i would love in our song teardrops on my guitar interlude a should have said no from debut i really truly believe that people could still rock to should have said no i would give <laughs> i it's too much to ask for her to throw a chair. She's doing so much on this show. She's already performing for three hours. She's literally putting on like a little vaudeville act for everybody. It's too much to ask for her to throw a chair. But God, would I love it if she did. <laughs> and had a little debut interlude with Teardrops on My Guitar, our song, and then should have said no, and that's it. And that's just the little debut set. That's my dream. That's my dream. Not in another um, Speak Now song. I'm only asking for one, Taylor, because I know, I know, I know you simply don't want to give it. Um, and so one is all I humbly beg for, but we'll get, we'll get to that. I have more to say. To that end, I don't necessarily need as much of Lavender Haze as we're getting. Um, or really it at all. Same with Midnight Rain. I don't, I like both of those songs. I really do. I guess it's just, I'm a little bit, I don't know. They've lost their importance to me live. I like the production of both. And I know it's like the opening and then like the outfit change. So we kind of need both of them. But I guess just like when I was like looking at the new set list, um, when like the tracks changed, I was like, so these are the ones. Um, Champagne Problems, Wildest Dreams, Midnight Rain, and Lavender Haze that I was like, now if we could just bump those ones and get some of my pretties, some of my faves um, up on stage, then all my dreams would be complete. So I don't mind the Tortured Poets Department title track song. I don't love it. It's not my favorite on the album, but I feel like people have serious problems with the lyrics in that song and they don't bother me as much as I feel like they bother some other people. I read it very much as a poem and I feel like it is very hyper specific in a way that Taylor really wanted it to be. I feel like it really fits a picture of that relationship at that moment and depicts how she was feeling very very clearly and I think that it did what she wanted it to do. Um, the production is it's fun um, it's just I'm not sure the chorus doesn't make it the most interesting song ever to me. Um, I do feel like there are some, I don't know, I just, I'm not super engaged by the chorus, I guess is the best thing I can say. I'm not sure the Dylan Thomas, Patti Smith line landed the way she wanted it to. It definitely got us all to Google it. Um, but I feel like 
it's a that one was a little bit too hyper specific and just kind of was like a stumble in the chorus and I feel like it was the most interesting line in the chorus because the rest is like who's gonna know you who's gonna hold you etc and so it's not my favorite song ever but I feel like there are some real like haters of this song who are like worst title track stupid lyrics like awful 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 um and I do I do have some positive things to say about this song I definitely will let it play in the background it came on when I was walking my dog earlier today um and I was just kind of bopping along like watching my dog walk like not particularly like in any type of mood just kind of like in need of background music and I did I let it play and you know I I bopped along um and there are some lyrics in the verses that I really enjoy I like the first I really like the first verse um a lot. I don't have as much of a problem with the second verse and the bridge as other people do. People really have a problem with the second verse. I don't. I do prefer the first verse and the bridge, um, but I feel like the second verse is exactly what she wanted it to be and could it have been workshopped a little bit more? Yeah, but I still think she wanted to say we got high and you ate a lot and we were just kind of joking around and saying stupid things um, that we connected over. I, I think that was still going to be her point and so I think she was still going to say something a little cringy and referencing marijuana and so I'm not sure I don't know I'm not sure that was going to be super remedied in any way um like I said do I think it could have been workshopped maybe do I think it would change drastically eh um but I'm not I'm not a huge huge hater of this song um it's definitely not in my bottom three Going off of that, I enjoy Fortnite. I bop to Fortnite. I find Fortnite very easy to listen to and of the songs that I find just like easy to listen to in background music on this album, this is my favorite one of them. Um, I I love the lyrics. I just, I love it from start to finish. I think it starts off very slow, but once you're into the first chorus, you really kind of get into it and then Posty comes in and you're just off and then they have this amazing layering thing that they have at the end that of calling you but you won't pick up another fortnight lost in America, moved to Florida, bought the car you want and I'm just such a sucker for that. I love how they sound together. I love how it's mixed. I think it sounds great. Um, I love the little bike bells in the background of like the suburban neighborhood. I just, I really vibe to this song. I really enjoy it. Um, and it's not even on like a super deep level. I just enjoy the sound of it. And I like um, bopping along to it. It's a great, just easy song to put on and like not have any qualms with. That being said, I would like a little bit less of it on the tour to make a little bit more room for Guilty as Sin. Um, and that's like my last tour opinion. I like that Fortnite is there and I like how it kind of like mixes in um, with Down Bad. I think that's really nice and I enjoy that transition. I get that like for like all the work they did with like the choreography and the set piece that like they're gonna do the amount of it that they do but I really would just like them to do like a chorus and then go into the thought of calling you move to Florida and then wrap it up um I don't I don't need that much of it um I could do I could do with even less um to be honest I just like the way it intermingles with down bad I think it's necessary to have it there um I just just, I'm asking for Guilty as Sin to be more of a star than it is and I understand that the light will never publicly shine upon Guilty as Sin, this far too horny a song um, for Taylor to do that in the form of making it a single or a music video or whatever. I would just like some love for it on the tour set list that I'm never going to get. I'm done harping on that point. Let's get to my one popular but important opinion and that is, I'm sure you know, that Long Live should have stayed on the tour set list. It should have stayed. It belongs on the Ares tour. Long Live belongs on the Ares tour. It is about the fans. It is about the magic of Taylor Swift and her fans and her tour and a little bit, a little bit about the Fearless tour and um, Big Machine, um, which is why I, I have, I have a handful of reasons. I think that it might have been cut from the set list that among them another that it just kind of slid easily right out, easy come, easy go. And I think that was definitely the case for a lot of the cuts from the set list. But I also think it would be kind of cool if she brought it back for the very last show of the Eras tour. Um, I think that would be very symbolic of saying long live all the magic we made. That was kind of the original point of the song in the first place. Um, I have I have more theories, but I think I'm probably gonna make a TikTok on it. I don't wanna like belither on about it too long here. If you were not going to do some of the bigger 
bigger icons from that album if it's just going to be enchanted i think it's a perfect sister to that and i feel like if you were really only going to do one song and it wasn't enchanted let it be long live honestly that that just fits with the eras tour concept so well in the celebration of the eras and the coming up of taylor swift and her eras of music and her life and her connection and like the story with her fans and everything and so that's what that song's about and so i feel like it belongs on the eras tour so perfectly thank um, you so so very much for watching this video let me know if you agree with any of these unpopular opinions they are just unpopular as perceived by me these are things that I know that I feel and that I think that I feel like I've seen a lot of the opposite um, thought on the internet other than this very last one that I just kind of didn't count because I know I've seen a lot of people a lot of people um riding for long live and defending and defending the need for its presence on this tour so let me know what you guys think let me know if you agree with or disagree with or have seen other takes on these opinions i love to hear what you guys think thank you so 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 very much for being here it means the absolute world to me if you made it to the end of this video and you liked it feel free to give it a like it makes me so so very happy and it makes a big difference in my little journey here on this platform so thank you once again for being here if you would like to see more content from me i am posting every single freaking day on tiktok and i have tons of content there i have tons of content on here it really is just absolutely embarrassing um how much i have spoken on the internet and how much I continue to speak. So feel free to check that out and I will be back with another video very, very soon. Thank you so much for being here again. Let me know. Are we doing the cardigan, the big oversized cardigan? Or, or the sheer collared shirt? I struggle. I think we're gonna have to go with this one. I'm so sorry to my new cardigan.